Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Zulkar, and uh, uh, I will be speaking about uh, uh, client focus reforms to National Instrument 31103 with my colleague uh, Ali Sahir. And we will be speaking specifically about uh, conflict of interest practices of Alberta registrants. It's actually a lot to talk about, so it will take me a lot of reading today. As you probably already know, the CFR concluded an extensive consultation process that began in 2012. Two consultation papers were published. Proposed amendments were released for comments. Town hall and round tables were held in Alberta and across Canada, and over 100 comment letters were received as part of that process. The result was the CFR amendments published in October 2019. The amendments also included active participation in the CSA working group of the SROs, which at the time were MFDA and IROC. The final amendments were also incorporated into SRO member rules and guidance, thus all registrants will be subject to the same baseline requirements. The amendments are intended to better align registrant interests with the interests of the, their clients, improve outcome for clients, and clarify the nature and terms of clients' relationship with registrants. Before the amendments, registrants were required to disclose and control or avoid material conflict of interest. Further, when recommending an investment product, they were required to determine if it was suitable for a client. With the CFRs, there are two fundamental changes. First, a registrant is now required to address a material conflict of interest in the best interest of their client. Second, a registrant will not only have to consider specific factors when deciding whether an investment product is suitable, but they will also have to determine that their recommendation puts the client's interest first. As part of implementing these amendments, staff across the CSA and the former MFTA and IROC went out to a sample of registrants to determine compliance with the new requirements. As Adam stated in his opening remarks, staff will be doing something similar with the KYC, KYP, and suitability requirements under these new amendments, but, the, but this presentation will focus on our conflict of interest findings in Alberta. Under the new CFR requirements concerning conflict of interest, registrants must take reasonable steps to identify existing and foreseeable material conflict of interest. Registrants must address those material conflicts in the best interest of their clients, and if there is no way of, uh, to address a material conflict of interest in the best interest of client using controls, that conflict must be avoided. We expect registrants to identify any circumstances where their interest and the interest of a client are inconsistent or divergent. The registrant may be influenced to put their interest ahead of their client's interest or monetary or non-monetary benefits available to a registrant or other potential disadvantages may compromise the, uh, the trust a reasonable client has in their registrant. The materiality of a conflict will depend on the circumstances. For example, what kind of clients are impacted by the conflict? Are these clients sophisticated or retail investors? We expect registrants to use their professional judgment and consider whether the conflict may be expected to affect the decision of the client and the recommendations or decision of the registrant. Next, we will discuss conflict of interest identified in registrant reviews and some of the controls used by the registrants. Composition such as commissions that the firm and DRs receive and other issuer payments to firms and related individuals employed or contracted by the firm are almost always a material conflict as they may influence the conduct of the firm and its registered individuals when dealing with their clients and performing other functions such as KYP. We direct you to section 13.4 of the Companion Policy 31103 for detailed examples of controls relating to this conflict, including the following. Documenting how the securities are aligned with client interest and the services provided to clients. Maintaining internal compensation arrangements for registered individuals that are not purely based on their level of sales. Monitoring client trades to determine if products that pay higher compensation are sold mostly versus other products imposing consequences for breaches of the firm's conflict of interest policies and procedures, including securities that provide lower level of third-party compensation or no third-party compensation in the firm's product shelf evaluation process, and ensure that the process is free from bias. Requiring that all securities be subject to the same KYC, KYP process and selection criteria regardless of their level of compensation, 
and conducting periodic due diligence of, to determine whether securities on the firm shelf are comparative with comparable alternative available in the market. Some firms we reviewed did not recognize that for a registrant to trade in or recommend proprietary products is an inherent conflict of interest that is almost always material, as there is the potential that the registrant will put their interest or the interest of related entities above their client's interest when making trades or recommendations. In addition, we found that firms that only trade in proprietary products relied primarily on performing suitability determinations and providing clients with the conflict disclosure to address this material conflict of interest. In our view, this is not always adequate to address these material conflict of interest in the best interest of the client, partic particularly for less sophisticated retail investors. Our reviews also found that some firms did not provide updated disclosure to their clients as they were waiting to start raising more capital before updating their disclosure documents. Some firms did not provide disclosure that their product shelf was exclusively composed of proprietary products. And commonly, many firms did not update their procedures to reflect new controls that had been adopted as a result of the CFRs. The recommended example of control relating to this conflict include the following. Documenting how proprietary products fit within the firm's business model and strategy and how they are aligned with clients' interests clearly disclosing that only proprietary products are distributed by the firm. Conduct periodic due diligence on comparable non-proprietary products available in the market and evaluate how competitive proprietary products are against other options in relation to performance, fees, and other qualitative and quantitative factors. Determining types of investors, who, investors for whom the proprietary products may be appropriate ensuring robust ongoing oversight of the suitability of proprietary products for the, the client portfolio, and obtaining independent advice on or independent evaluation of the effectiveness of firm's policies, procedures, and control to address this con conflict. Following are some of the suggested controls for firms that trade in proprietary products as part of a wider shelf that also includes third-party products. Prohibiting monetary or non-monitoring benefits that could bias individual recommendations toward proprietary products. Ensuring that proprietary products are subject to the same KYP due diligence and selection process as well as ongoing monitoring of performance and other criteria when compared to non-proprietary products. Making non-proprietary products as easy to access for registered individuals and clients as proprietary products. Monitoring the use and level of proprietary products in client portfolios or in trade suitability recommendations, and providing clear disclosure to clients about the nature of the firm's product offerings and the extent to which proprietary products may be included in the client portfolios. Our reviews found that some firms did not identify that different or multiple fee schedules could be material conflict of interest in cer certain circumstances, such as when clients receive substantially similar products or services. For example, when client invest in the same model portfolios or purchase the same exempt market products. We observed firms that had a standard fee schedule but allowed some clients to negotiate fees or deviate from the standard fee schedule, and firms that changed their standard fee schedule to offer new clients lower fees or the same or substantially similar products or services to compete with other registrants and grow their business but continue to charge their legacy client higher fees. Similarly, conflict of interest arise in relation to dealers charging different spreads, commissions, and other charges when clients are purchasing the same or substantially the same exempt market securities. Firms can adopt following controls relating to this conflict of interest. Where the firms has a standard fee schedule but allows some clients to negotiate fees, set up a standard fee schedule that are based on measurable criteria including the client's account size and type, types of products sold or managed, the nature of the client registrant relationship, and the level of service provided to the client. Require a registered individual that proposes to deviate from the standard fee schedule to seek prior approval from the firm's chief compliance officer or senior management, and disclose to all clients and describe the circumstances under which the firm is prepared to negotiate fees or deviate from the firm's standard fee schedule. Where the, firm change, where the firm changes its standard fee schedule to offer new clients lower fees for the same or substantially similar products or services in order to compete with other registrants, 
but continued to charge their legacy client higher fees. Disclose and explain to each affected legacy client that this fee change means and offers to switch the legacy client to the needs schedule. We noted that some firms reviewed failed to identify instances where a registered individual was a member of the board of director of a new issuer whose securities the firm dealt in or advised in as a material conflict of interest. Nominee directors owe a fiduciary duty to the issuers on whose board they serve, but the same individuals are also required to address, address material conflict of interest in the best interest of their clients and also owe their clients the duty to act fairly, honestly, and in good faith. These conflicting obligations may, arise, uh, may give rise to a material conflict of interest, for example, when decisions are being made at the board level, which could have a negative impact on the investors. We noted that some firms implemented the following controls to address the material conflict of interest associated with nominee directors. Restricting the compensation that nominee directors may accept, establishing ethical walls or when possible, removing conflicted employees from the investment decision-making roles at the registered firm, and disclosing to the firm's clients such board memberships. We identified the following additional suggested controls. Policy, policies outlining applicable corporate law requirements regarding obligations that nominee directors declare conflict of interest and in most conflicted situations abstain from voting on a particular contract or transaction providing clear disclosure to firm clients that a potential conflict of interest may exist because of the registrant's role as a nominee director and the associated, ob associated obligations they owe to the investee company. In addition to the applicable corporate law restrictions, the nominee director should recuse themselves from board discussions or dis decisions that involve the firms, its clients, or any companies or investment with which the registrant is involved requiring that nominee directors resign from the board of an investee company when conflict of interest arising from this role cannot be addressed in the best interest of the registered firm's clients. Now I will request uh, Alisa Heath to proceed with the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ali Zahir. Thank you, Zulker. Uh, just to let you know, this slides will be posted on our website later this summer, so if you miss any of the points, that's quite all right. We'll get to them later on as well. So to begin, all right, paid referral arrangements, whether they are referrals into a registered firm or referrals of a registered firm's clients out to another entity are inherent conflicts of interest, which in our experience are almost always material conflicts of interest and must be addressed in the best interest of clients. The payment of a referral fee to obtain a client or the receipt of a referral fee to refer a client can influence a registrant to put their interest in their growing their business or receiving referral fee revenue ahead of the client's interests. When assessing whether inbound referrals are material conflicts of interest, we expect firms to consider the following factors. The extent to which the firm depends on the referral arrangement, the number of clients that are referred to the firm, and the amount of revenue earned compared to non-referred clients. The firm's analysis and determination as to whether an inbound referrals are a material conflict of interest should consider the factors above and must be adequately documented, especially when the registrant has concluded there is no material conflict of interest. As a general rule, if a client is referred to a registrant, the registrant may not charge the client more than their other non-referred clients for the same or substantially similar, pro substantially similar products or services. When addressing material conflicts of interest associated with inbound referrals, we identified the following controls. Oversight to be completed by the firm's chief compliance officer or senior management to ensure that all clients, referred or non-referred clients, are treated fairly by the registrant. For example, no, fav no favoritism is extended to the referred clients in order to attract more referrals from a referral agent. For example, in a significant mar market downturn, the registrant is more responsive to the needs of a referred client in order to maintain a positive relationship with the referral agent. Or referred clients' needs are not neglected because the registrant views these clients as less profitable than other non-referred clients. Oversight of the activities conducted by the referral agent to ensure that all registrable activities done by the firm and its registered individuals are not delegated to the referral agent. Requiring that unre unregistered referral agents that make referrals to a firm attend training on how to adequately conduct referrals. Requiring that unregistered referral agents that make referrals to a firm only use pre-approved marketing materials and social media content 
in relation to the referral. Conducting ongoing compliance calls to investors who may have been referred to the firm to assess how the process is being conducted by each referral party. And to the extent the registrant collects fees from a client's account and remits those fees to the referral agent to pay for additional services provided by the referral agent to the client, such as insurance or financial planning, a process is in place for the registrant to verify that the referral agent did in fact provide the services for which they're being compensated before collecting and remitting the fees. When addressing material conflicts of interest associated with outbound referrals, in addition to conducting the necessary due diligence to determine that the referral arrangement would be in the best interest of the client, we identified the following controls related to the ongoing monitoring and supervision of referral agreements. Annual questionnaires sent to and interviews of registered individuals receiving referral fees on the nature and the extent of their involvement in referral arrangements. Ongoing assessment of compensation received by registered individuals under the referral arrangements, including an assessment of the quantum and the duration of the compensation and whether this is reasonable in the circumstances. Taking into account the nature and the extent of the products and services being provided to the client by the other party. Assessing complaints and other information received in connection with referral arrangements to ensure compliance by all referral parties. We noted that some exempt market dealer firms, their principals, their affiliates, and registered individuals trade in the same issuers alongside their clients or the firm's clients, but failed to identify this as a material conflict of interest. In some cases, the securities acquired by the firm and its representatives were issued at a lower price or more favorable terms when compared with the securities that were being distributed to the arm's length clients. We also observed instances when firms had small offerings with limited availability and and priority was given to the firm's employees and firms and employees and of entities instead of arm's length clients. Issuers with limited redemption terms may also give rise to conflicts of interest. When the firm or the dealing representative are requesting to redeem their securities and there are potential gating restrictions, such as when the issuer caps maximum annual redemptions. When addressing material conflicts of interest associated with trades alongside clients, we identified the following potential controls. When an issuer when an issuer's offering of securities is limited, the firm, the firm's registered individuals and employees should not be allowed to trade in the, firm's in the issuer's securities until all client orders are fulfilled. And if the registrant becomes aware that an issuer that normally permits redemptions is about to freeze or gate redemptions, the firm and the firm's registered individuals and employees should not be allowed to redeem their own securities before all affected clients are informed and given the opportunity to redeem. We note that firms generally identified the provision or receipt of gifts and entertainment as a material conflict of interest. However, the firm did not always have adequate controls in place to address this conflict in the best interest of clients. Consequently, registered individuals did not have clear guidance on what to do when they were offered or were considering to give gifts or entertainment. For example, we observed firms that did not have clear parameters or criteria to set out what is an acceptable or unacceptable gift or entertainment. Firms that lacked a clear process for reporting and obtaining approvals in relation to gifts and entertainments. Firms that had inadequate processes in place to approve and document the approval of gifts and entertainments. We observed that firms reviewed took various approaches to addressing this conflict and controls implemented by firms included the following. Maintain a log of all gifts provided and received. The log should include sufficient detail for the firm to perform an adequate review and assessment conducting a periodic review at least annually to verify that no individual is receiving an unreasonable number of gifts and that no individual has exceeded any prescribed limits imposed by the firm. Monitor the gift log to, ass to assess if excessive or frequent gifts are being received from a particular party that may present a material conflict of interest that must be avoided. Prohibit the receipt or provision of any monetary gifts. Implement guidelines on what the firm considers to be a reasonable value for the receipt, provision of gifts, entertainment, including a stipulation that any gift above prescribed dollar amount requires the approval of the chief compliance officer before the gift can be accepted or provided by a registered individual. Consider requiring that any gift provided to clients must be nominal in value and, require that pre and requires the pre-approval of the chief compliance officer. Where gifts are received by or provided to the chief compliance officer, require pre-approval from another member of senior management. 
In our reviews, we have observed exempt market dealers that were not adequately addressing material conflicts associated with the management of related party issuers. For example, these firms were not conducting an independent assessment of the value of the issuer, including that of any illiquid assets held in the investment fund or held by the issuer. An inadequate assessment of the issuer's fair value may result in investors purchasing and redeeming securities at a price that does not reflect the fair value of the security. We have also observed firms that were using stale values, like the issuer's original offering price or the price paid to acquire underlying assets when calculating management fees and performance fees. This may result in funds being charged higher fees than if fair value of the issuer was used. We also saw firms that did not have a process in place to properly document and allocate how each investment fund or issuer pays for any shared expense. Registrants must consider the following when considering how to address this conflict in the best interest of their clients. Use independent third-party resources, such as auditors to calculate and or verify the value of underlying net assets, management fees, and performance-based compensation. Establish clear criteria for how the investment fund or issuer will process redemptions and purchases and identify instances where the, when redemptions and purchases must not be processed. For example, when the value of the net assets of the investment fund or issuer is stale dated. With such criteria clearly disclosed to investors. And establish clear criteria for how shared expenses will be allocated between multiple funds or issuers or issuers managed by the same firm with such criteria clearly disclosed to investors. Now we'll discuss some other areas that must be considered by firms in relation to their conflicts of interest. In our reviews, we found that firms had established policies and procedures for conflicts of interest. However, commonly, many firms had not updated their policies to a level that would ensure compliance with CFR requirements. For example, we found policies and procedures manuals that did not have a clear definition of conflicts of interest and did not include examples of conflicts of interest commonly associated with the firm's business model. Did not include criteria that would assist individuals in, and the firm in determining the materiality of the conflicts identified lack processes for the firm to monitor and oversee the firm and register individuals' activities on an ongoing basis. Did not explain the conflicts of interest responsibilities for the registered individuals included in section 13.41 of National Instrument 31103, namely that individuals must take reasonable steps to identify existing or reasonable foreseeable material conflicts of interest between them and their clients. Report all identified material conflicts of interest to the firm must avoid a material conflict of interest if it cannot be addressed in the best interest of the client, must address all material conflicts in the best interest of a client, and must receive approval from the firm before engaging in advising or trading activities associated with a material conflict of interest. Did not cover how the firm would assess and determine how to address conflicts of interest in the best interest of clients, and lack processes for training registered individuals and employees in relation to conflicts of interest. When disclosing conflicts of interest, registered firms are required to include a description of the nature and the extent of the conflicts of interest, the potential impact and the risk of that conflict of interest could pose to clients, and how the conflict of interest has been or will be addressed. During our reviews, we noted some firms did not update their conflicts of interest disclosures to comply with the new CFI requirements. We also noted that even when the disclosure was updated by firms, the disclosure did not consistently cover all the required elements. In particular, we noted that while many firms disclose the nature and extent of a conflict, disclosure relating to the potential impact on and the risk of the conflict could pose to, pose to the client and how the firm addressed this conflict was often missing. Where disclosure was provided, a significant number of firms had incomplete or partial disclosure. For example, we noted reviewed firms did not adequately disclose the following materials conflicts, material conflicts of interest. Internal compensation and incentives such as bonus structures, compensation from clients including variance in fee structures, third-party compensation, outside activities, distribution of proprietary products, referral arrangements, and related and connected issuers. Format of disclosure. For registered firms that successfully completed their disclosure requirements were able to do so because they expressly laid out each element of the required disclosure in a clear and concise manner. Disclosure prepared by another entity. We noted that some firms reviewed relied on disclosure documents that were prepared by another entity. For example, disclosures related to conflicts of interest described in issuer's documents, their offering memorandum, 
However, where this type of conflicts disclosure is preferred, prepared solely from the issuer's perspective and does not reflect the registered firm's perspective, this disclosure would not be adequate. This type of reliance could result in non-compliance by the registered firm with its own conflicts of, of interest disclosure required under the, by the CFRs. Considerations of a reasonable client. A registered firm must disclose in writing all material conflicts of interest identified to a client whose interests are affected by the conflicts of interest if a reasonable client would expect to be informed of those conflicts. This disclosure is critical to their ability to make an informed decision about how to manage and evaluate the relationship with the registrant. We noted some instances where the firms identified material conflicts of interest, but did not disclose those conflicts to all of their clients whose interests were affected. We remind registrants that CFR conflicts of interest requ requirements apply to all clients, including permitted clients and institutional clients. There are no exemptions from conflicts of interest required on the, based on client type. However, we recognize that for some specific conflicts of interest, there may be instances where a firm determines a, that a reasonable client would not reasonably expect to be informed of the specific material conflict of interest, and that disclosure is therefore not necessary. In these circumstances, the firm must consider its client base and must be able to demonstrate how it arrived at that conclusion. Timing of disclosure. Some firms we reviewed provided disclosure to clients, but the disclosure was not provided in a timely manner as required. A firm must disclose a material conflict of interest during the account opening process, if the conflict had been identified at that time, or in a timely manner upon identification of the material conflict that must be disclosed that has not been previously disclosed to a client. Although, although there is no prescribed format, firms must document their identification, review, and an analysis of conflicts of interest. Their determination as to whether a conflict is material and the controls used by the firm to ensure that material conflicts have been addressed in the client's best interest. Registrants should exercise professional judgment to assess what level of detail needs to be documented in records in order for them to demonstrate that they have complied with, with their conflicts of interest obligations. As the materiality of a conflict increases, there should be greater detail in the records maintained to demonstrate compliance. The CFRs have included uh, additional specific requirements relating to conflicts of interest for firms to maintain records, to demonstrate compliance with conflicts of interest obligations, and document one, the firm's sales practices, compensation arrangements, and incentive practices, and two, other compensation arrangements and incentive practices from which the firm or its registered individuals or any affiliate or associate of that firm benefit specific guidance relating to the record keeping requirements for sales. Sales practice and compensation are available in section 11.5 of the companion policy of 31.103. Firms should cr consider creating and maintaining a conflicts inventory that includes the following. A description of each material conflict of interest identified by the firm. A description of the firm's assessment for conducting whether or not the con conflict is material including the criteria considered in making the assessment, the potential impact and risk that the conflict can pose, who at the firm was involved in identifying the conflict and making the assessment of whether or not it is material, the controls the firm has in place to manage or address each material conflict of interest, and how these controls are sufficient to address the conflict in the best interest of client. How the firm, disclosed, how the firm has disclosed these conflicts to clients, Maintain, an evidence, maintain evidence of periodic review of the conflicts inventory and controls associated with each material conflict of interest. Firms should also perform periodic reviews in order to confirm that all previously identified conflicts of interest remain relevant and confirm that there are new con no new conflicts of interest. Periodic, re periodic reviews should include testing by the firm of the controls implemented, their effectiveness in addressing each material conflict in the best interest of the clients. The review should be completed as often as necessary when the firm's business, structure, model, product, or service offering changes, but at a minimum should be completed on an annual basis. Thank you very much.